All right, good afternoon, everyone. You're in the listed species and coastal habitats breakout session this afternoon. And I'm Caitlin Snyder, and I'm back from mangroves yesterday, and I'm here to host you this afternoon. Um, we've got a lot of interesting presentations lined up um, across birds and herps. So I think our first presenter will be Nick Vital from Florida Fish and Wildlife. So as I'm introducing him, I'm wondering if he can get his webcam and audio going. Nick will be presenting on the loss of coastal islands along Florida's Big Bend, implications for breeding American oyster catchers. When you're ready, Nick, um, take it away and let us know if you have any issues. All right, can everybody hear me? We can, yes. And you should have keyboard and mouse controls on the presentation. Okay, cool. Uh, so I had two computers fail at letting me log on here today, so I ended up resorting to using my phone. So hopefully all that works according to how it should, but uh, we'll uh, Okay, we'll make it. Uh, since you're on your phone, you can just uh, tell me when to advance the slides and I got you. All right, that works too. All right, I'm ready to go. So yeah, uh, as, as Caitlin said, I'll be uh, kind of switching gears from some of the other talks we've had so far today and, and talking about birds. Uh, so this work is from my graduate work that I completed a, a couple of years ago, and uh, we just recently published uh, the results of this this study uh, this past fall. So if anybody's interested in knowing more about this, uh, I'm happy to share that paper with you. So next slide. So just before we get started, I just kind of want to mention that you know this was my grad work, but there was a huge team effort. There's a lot of different people from FWC, uh, University of Florida. Uh, and a number of different other groups and, and a lot of different field staff that helped out. So I'll just give a quick shout out to them uh, before we get going. So for anybody who's not familiar, I figured I'd start with a little bit of background on American oyster catchers because that was the focus of this study. So uh, as their name implies, they primarily are eating uh, oysters and other marine bivalves, but they're, they're also consuming uh, different invertebrates as well. But very marine and coastal uh, dependent species. So American oyster catchers are listed as a species of high conservation concern uh, in the US and here in Florida, they are state listed as threatened. And this is largely due to a, a small breeding population, um, but that breeding populations are largely limited by insufficient breeding habitat to support a, a large and stable population. And so what that means for this species is that um, all the habitat that we do have that these birds are using for nesting is really important for uh, maintaining and recovery of this species here in Florida. They also exhibit extremely high site fidelity. So once they find a place to nest, they generally come back to the same location year after year. Um, so again, the habitats that they are using are, are very important to, to maintain. Okay, next slide. So this work actually took place over in the Big Bend, specifically uh, a site in Cedar Key and uh, some spoil islands down in Citrus County. So a bit different than, than what we've been talking about in the Apalachicola area, but a lot of the patterns we see here, uh, I think translate really closely to, to what we see here in the Panhandle. So um, I think it's still really relevant to this group. Um, so this study focused, like I said, in Cedar Key and a set of spoil islands down in Citrus County. Um, and these represent some of the, the larger concentrations of breeding American oyster catchers in Florida. Uh, and it's important to point out that this region is, is a bit unique in that it doesn't have large barrier islands like we see in other areas. And so um, a lot of these nesting islands are out um, offshore and, and don't have kind of the protection that those barrier islands would provide in, in different areas. Okay, next. So just to dive a little bit more into the, the two study sites we had, um, the Spoil Island site is just that. They're man-made Spoil Islands that were constructed in the late 1960s. They're made of mostly large limestone rock and uh, above the high tide line, they're, they're rather densely vegetated. Uh, our other site was a series of uh, small natural islands surrounding the Cedar Key area. Um, so these are mostly sand and shell, shell substrate and the vegetation on them is a lot more variable. It's also worth pointing out that historically, a lot of these islands had uh, oysters growing around their perimeters or nearby. Um, so a bit different from our, our spoil island site. 
Okay, so uh, what we wanted to look at for this study was looking at habitat change, specifically long-term habitat changes for uh, the, the islands that these birds are using to nest on. And we're looking at availability and also quality. And so this question came about for a number of reasons. The first being oyster reef declines, as many people are familiar with in the Apalachicola area, but um, also throughout the Big Bend. So uh, recent work by CV and others showed that oyster reefs in the Big Bend uh, region of Florida have declined by as much as 88% over the last 30 years. Um, and so this oyster reef habitat as part of a, a living shoreline really provides a critical role for uh, shoreline protection and wave attenuation when it comes to uh, these islands that the oyster catchers are using. So the concern was that when oyster reefs decline, um, as they have in the Big Bend, this ecosystem service is lost and uh, we'll see increased shoreline erosion. And so, uh, as you can see now, some field observations have shown this exact pattern of um, some islands were definitely eroding. Uh, pictured here is Derrick Key. Uh, over a 10 year period, it went from a fairly large island that supported uh, five pairs of nesting oyster catchers to uh, nothing more than a sandbar. So uh, we definitely saw some of this going on before we even started this study. Okay, next slide. So to do this work, we uh, collected aerial imagery of our two study areas over approximately a four year period. You can see the time uh, periods vary a little bit between the sites based on uh, what imagery was available. Uh, once we had that, we digitized uh, the shorelines of all of our nesting islands along the high tide line and used that to calculate the total area of the islands and do a number of analyses looking at how the shoreline changed over time. Okay, next slide. We'll jump right straight into results. I'll only share uh, kind of the, the highlights. Um, so this figure is uh, showing percent change in the island area uh, across time. Uh, so change from our first time period. So in this case, 1979. As you can see, there's a really clear pattern in that all of our nesting islands that we, we measured have decreased over time. So uh, for the Spoil Island site, which you're looking at here, uh, the total area lost was 55% over our time period. Um, and three of our westernmost islands have actually disappeared completely. Um, uh, so, an interesting thing about this, uh, we jumped ahead, but we're good. <laughs> so, spoil islands decreased uh, pretty linearly across time, which kind of makes sense being artificially made and, and not maintained. But uh, if you go to the next one now for Cedar Key, the pattern's a bit different here. Um, again, all of our islands decreased in size, um, but you can see for the first couple of years, we really didn't see rapid decreases. Um, so the total area lost of nesting islands in Cedar Key decreased by 39% over our 40 year time period, but 85% of that change occurred after 1995. And if we look at the timing of that, um, it really closely follows that of uh, when oyster reefs declined in the region. And so we really do think that those oyster reefs were providing a, a critical role uh, stabilizing these, these nesting islands. And when you lose those, the islands start disappearing really quickly. So if we go to the next slide, we'll kind of see a visual of what this looks like. So this is two of our nesting islands uh, that were historically used, Derrick Key and McClamory. And they're the, the two larger islands in this, the picture, but those rest of those structures are oyster reefs that historically surrounded those. So this is 1982, and if we go to the next one, you can see this is 2016. So quite a big change. All of, uh, a vast majority of the oyster reefs that were surrounding these islands and providing that protection from wave and wind energy are gone. So it's not just a difference in, in tide cycle, um, but those actually are eroded. And you can see our two islands have rapidly eroded. Derrick Key, as I said before, has actually completely disappeared over the past 40 years. Okay, so we go to the next slide. Um, so what does this mean for oyster catchers? As we said, all of our islands in our study have eroded over time. So this means both uh, smaller areas, so they have less space to nest, um, but we also believe that these islands were decreasing in elevation over time. And since oyster catchers nest directly on the ground, they're laying their eggs right in the sand, as you can see on the left picture there, it makes them really susceptible to uh, high tide or storm events washing away their, their nests. Um, and so in this area, this is by far our number one cost uh, cause of nest failure. And um, so the habitat that does remain is, is really 
poor quality at this point. Um, again, going back to what I said at the beginning of oyster catchers have extremely high site fidelity and they're limited in breeding habitat in Florida. It means that these birds really don't have other options and they're not trying to find or they're not moving to, to other areas to nest. They're really stuck with what they, they currently have and they continue to try to nest on these sites uh, despite them the failing repeatedly. So if we go to the next slide. Um, the good news is uh, because of this work, we were able to document these, these changes in habitat and um, determine kind of what was causing it. And uh, so restoration is hopefully coming soon at at least one of our nesting islands. This is a picture of Gomez Key and you can see over time again, it's really drastically decreased in size. Um, but uh, because of the study, we were able to help really push for some restoration uh, effort and hopefully that'll be starting soon and uh, restoring some of this, this important nesting habitat. Okay, so next slide. So what about the panhandle? What about here? I'm talking about Cedar Key. That's that's not the same as what we're talking about here. Obviously, a lot of these previous presentations have talked about some changes in Apalachicola Bay and everybody knows about uh, oyster die-offs here as well. So the question is, are similar patterns occurring here? Uh, we haven't done an extensive study like what I just described here, but uh, you know, we do know that uh, some of our nesting sites do frequently have nests failing to overwash and again they're they're rather habitat limited so um, we got to protect what there is and any potential for uh, habitat creation or restoration through projects directly focused on on shorebirds but or or otherwise um, are going to be really key to supporting this population going into the future and that's all i got so i'll leave it there i think i got a minute for questions Thanks, Nick. Um, I actually think we're going to hold off on questions until all of our four speakers have gone through today, so we can kind of do a, a question panel session at the end. Um, but yeah, that's definitely some concerning research uh, that we found in the Big Bend. And hopefully um, someone like Rhea could give us some better news about some shorebird con conservation. Uh, Rhea is with the Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, Conservation Commission, and she's going to talk a little bit today about banding as an important tool for shorebird conservation. Are you with us today, Rhea? I am. Let's see. Hey. I got the unmuted. Let's see if I can do my camera here as well. We got you. It only took us two days to get this system down, but I think we got it. <laughs> okay, let's see. And I should have control of the... There we go. So, well, thanks guys. This is actually the first time I've ever attended one of your symposiums. So I thank you, uh, Caitlin, for uh, making me aware and um, uh, maybe even, you know, really pinning me down to make me agree to um, to attend here. I'm not sure how do I back up or how, uh, yeah, it seems like it was just going. <laughs> Let's see. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag. So just make sure you're clicking deliberately. Okay. I can just tell you next, it doesn't seem to be going, so we can just do that. Okay, um, so again, my name is Rhea Pruner, as Caitlin points out. I'm with the um, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, and you're not familiar, that's the research arm of the of the FWC. I mean, it's part of our um, ongoing management-based research in the Panhandle region. We actively uh, capture and ban three state-listed species. So the oyster catcher, as, as Nick walked us through, uh, Wilson's plovers and snowy plovers as well. Um, and based on time availability today, I'm really going to just focus on snowy plovers, which is our longest term uh, banding efforts. And they began in 2008, or about 13 years total now. And in general, when people hear about our banding program, sometimes they have concerns about, you know, marking efforts and things like that and the, you know, the, the uh, welfare of the birds. Um, but in general, they're curious about why we ban. And, you know, tracking and assessing observations of indi individually marked birds over time provides valuable information on their movements, behavior, survival, but it's also a valuable tool for conservation and to inform those management decisions. So I'm going to walk through some of the knowledge we have gained from our banding program and how that knowledge informs management. Next. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and as I mentioned, I'm going to focus on the snowy plover today. 
And for those of you that are unfamiliar with the snowy plover, um, they're a small ground nesting shorebird that nests throughout North America. And as you can see from the map here, there are three distinct populations, the Pacific, Interior, and then in the Eastern Gulf. And although they're widespread, they are tied highly to coastal or alkaline environments. So like the interior distribution, for example, is tied to salt flats and salt lakes. So you can see a large concentration around like the Great Salt Lake, for example, in Utah. Um, and wherever they occur, they prefer that open or sparsely vegetated flats, dunes, beachfronts, or washover type habitat. And this snowy plover population in Florida is considered a state threatened. And based on recent genetic work, the Florida population is considered to actually be isolated and distinct and is, and is recommended for management as its own conservation unit. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and as I said, you know, we're going to concentrate here on snowies in Florida. So in general, our, be our, our best estimate at this time is there are about 200 pair or 400 adults in the state population. We know that the population is declining and they breed from February to August. So given that long time, um, time period, they do overlap with the tourist season in Florida. And that's one of the major um, threats the species de uh, deals with. Um, you can see from the map on the right hand side of the, the slide there that the snowy plover in Florida is only on the Gulf Coast. Um, roughly 75 to 80 percent of the state population is found in the Panhandle, um, and the largest concentrations are at places in the Eastern Panhandle, particularly which St. Joseph State Park, Tyndall Air Force Base, and then you shift a little bit to the Central and West at Eglin Air Force Base and Gulf Islands. And again, those all stand out as large conservation areas in our region. Next slide, please. So just oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, and so just briefly, I'm going to talk just about some of the methods. Um, we ban both chicks and adults, and for the chicks, we capture them by hand. Um, uh, we, it's okay, we don't have to go back. They're banded opportunistically in the first observation. Chicks are not banded or captured if avian predators are present, and they're not captured banned if they appear weak. So for all of our methods, we're really trying to reduce stress and the impact bans have. And our adults are banded during pre-nesting, brood rearing, or during winter periods, again, to reduce that stress. We recognize and then we band on, on nests, for example. We might increase abandonment or uh, predation events and things like that. We also use playback calls for both capture, but also to re reduce stress in the, and um, reduce our handling time of, of birds. Next slide, please. Perfect. Okay. So assessing chick survival and productivity are often our most immediate and short-term questions. So for any given year and breeding site, we're interested in the number of chicks to fledge, the chick survival, or the number of fledged versus hatched chicks, and productivity, or the number of chicks to fledge per breeding male. So based on the shorebird conservation plan, one fledgling per male is needed for population growth. With this in mind, we are interested in influencing factors um, and how they influence um, and uh, survival, and then using those to inform management options and decisions. So the following results um, are based on our best fit models from our Young Survival Models and Program Mark. The most immediate uh, pressure influencing chick survival is predators, in particular ghost crabs and avian predators such as gulls, crows, and global terns influence chick survival. And using ghost crabs as an example, chicks experience higher survival when burrows are further from nest sites, and when nests are foraging in nests or foraging areas. Um, in uh, areas of low ghost crab density. Um, sorry if you can hear my, my four-year-old back here. Just a second, okay? Um, let's see here. Um, brood foraging habitat selection and survival are also highly tied to prey availability. So foraging habitat features like ephemeral pools and tidal mudflats provide higher prey items and thus chicks with access to these features experience higher survival rates. And lastly, human disturbance influences survival in a variety of ways. Most notably, human disturbance often results in protracted broodering periods, or in other words, instead of fledging in four weeks, they might be fledging in six to eight weeks, making them vulnerable for longer periods of time. Um, and just advance the slide twice, if you will, and it'll catch up to us. Um, and so if we assess chick survival at high quality sites, roughly one in 12 chicks that hatch fledge. And one more time. And, but when we add in those multiple stressors, we see that chick survival is lower and a greater number of chicks are needed to reach our productivity goals. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and if you're unaware, snowy plover chicks are both precocial, if you, if you could back up one, um, are both precocial and self-feeding at hatch. Um, I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> the one with the chick tracks, if you can. One more, back. Um, okay, so snowy plover chicks are both precocial and self-feeding at hatch. And unlike many species, the adults do not feed the chicks. Instead, they guide and guard them as they navigate the, na the landscape in search of food. And based on band observations, we know that chicks at just a couple of days old 
and weighing only about five grams at the time can travel more than nine, nine miles in search of food. I had an example at the very bottom of the, the, the slide here from Tyndall Air Force Base, and that's a contiguous stretch of coastal habitat that's about 14 miles long. If you look at the red dots, that's where our nest locations were, and those gold ovals is where the broods ended up. And again, what we see here is that the birds are moving from areas of high disturbance, and they're taking their chicks to feed at areas of high quality foraging habitat. Next slide, please. So continuing with the conversation about productivity, we can also look at an individual's reproductive output for their lifetime. Um, assessing that reproductive potential allows us to understand how management actions and environmental disturbances like hurricanes influence annual variation, and we can adjust our management decisions accordingly. So this individual is green, green, service blue based on the color of his bands. He was banded in 2008 at St. Joseph's State Park, and that makes him about 13 years old. Um, he fledged a total of eight chicks in his lifetime. However, what is interesting is that he fledged 40% of that lifetime output in just 2019, the year following Hurricane Michael. And this pattern was repeated for, for individuals in the hurricane impacted area where they, they likely benefited from the open and sparsely vegetated conditions that were created. Next slide, please. So similar to looking at the patterns of uh, individuals, we can also look at site-specific patterns. So for example, if we look at St. Joseph State Park, we often refer to it as a chick factory. From 2008 to 2020, which is actually 13 years instead of 12, we have uniquely banded 1,072 chicks um, across the Panhandle region. 445 of those chicks were confirmed to fledge, but 47%, or 207, fledged from just one park, and that's St. Joseph State Park found in Gulf County. Next slide, please. And again, um, using St. Joseph's, Joseph, Joseph's State Park due to the number of fledglings, we can look at natal dispersal patterns and get a better idea of population dynamics and movement patterns. Fledgling uh, dispersal is an average of 22 miles from where they hatch to where they breed in their first year. And we know that St. Joseph State Park is a source site for the snowy plover population in Florida. We also recognize that when conditions are poor at this park, we see local and statewide declines. So fledglings from the park have recruited into local breeding populations at every breeding site in the Panhandle and at two sites in the Peninsula region we can see from those two that are downward on the map there. So this type of information really helps us prioritize sites for management, but also helps us inform strategies for population growth. Similarly, we can look at winter dispersal patterns. I haven't updated this map in a couple of years, but uh, um, we now have some confirmed observations from both Mississippi and Louisiana. However, it still provides a visual of winter movement patterns. Roughly 25% of the panhandle population migrates, and I use mi migrates loosely because they move relatively short distances. They're not moving you know, to other regions of other continents or even um, you know, other regions of the U.S. Um, however, even with these regional movement patterns, we recognize that management needs for the breeding population extend beyond the Panhandle beaches, and the local conditions at winter sites can also influence the state breeding population, like some of the red tide issues that we see in southwest Florida. And because we have a long-term monitoring program, we are able to look at population trends over time as well. So using just the, state, the um, Panhandle state parks, we can see periods of both growth and decline or just advances, yeah, there you go, um, click. And we it, and we can look also at known disturbance events um, that may have contributed to some of these trends. So for example, we can see that the red tide events in 2015 and 2018 correl correlate with some of the low periods of the breeding population. And similarly, we can see that, that low, lowest period where Hurricane Michael occurred um, in 2018 and see that that subsequent breeding population in 2019 was significantly lower. And we can also look closely at periods of growth. And during this period, we know that the breeding populations were experiencing really high productivity, and we can assess the conditions from that time to inform future management decisions to hopefully realize population growth once again. I also wanted to touch briefly on survival, and since we just looked at the population trends of the state park, it is also important to look at the survival of the individuals that occurred in the hurricane area. All of the results here are based on our best fit Barker models using program mark, and Barker models allow you to use both live and dead observation, and it allows you to distinguish between dispersal and mortality to get a, a more accurate estimate of survival. So before looking at adult survival, I wanted to look uh, at the juvenile survival here, which is um, looking at the difference between the, the first winter and then an established adult. So you can see that the first winter is on the left-hand side, and, and then adults that were at least two years or more um, are on the right side. You can see that this is significantly lower uh, survival for that first winter for these guys. And then looking at the adult survival from uh, from when we began banning, so from 2008 to 2019 and 2020 here, we see a high and consistent survival, except for those two downward blips in 2015 and 2018. Next slide, or advanced one. And if we overlay, again, those known events that occurred during this time period, we can see that there was a 12% decline during a red tide event that occurred in 2015. That, that event was here in the Florida Panhandle. And then similarly, we can see that there was a 19% decline during the period of Hurricane Michael. So the last topic I wanted to mention is 
the importance of band reciting. All of our knowledge associated, um, all of our knowledge and the associated banded decisions that we have made are based on our ability to recite banded individuals. And to date, we've we've marked about 418 plovers as adults, and then we've had another 218 that were banded as chicks and recruited into a local breeding population. Reciting banded birds over time is a monumental effort. Advance one more. And we, we rely on our um, field biologists, but also rely heavy, heavily on partners and citizen scientists. We've made a variety of resources to make uh, band reporting easier. And you can see there, you can see our Florida Shorebird Alliance resources. And then we've also created a Florida Banded Birds resetting page on Facebook. So when observers um, report a, ba a banded bird or another tagged animal, um, they learn a little bit about that individual in the project. However, they're also contributing towards critical management decisions for imperiled species. And with those observations, banded birds and the assessment of the band recite data, we can be begin to understand what birds need, learn where to focus our conservation efforts, track the health of the population, and then more, most importantly, make informed management decisions for these species' well-being. And that is it. So it sounds like, Caitlin, we're going to save questions for the end. Yeah, thanks, Raya. You guys are doing so much work in the research component of FWC over there, and not just the van handle, but across Florida. So thanks for what you do. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, save questions for later on. You can type them in the questions section on the side there of the webinar, or you can go on the Padlet and write them underneath the abstracts for each speaker. So next we have Dan Catazone, and he's of USGS. And he's going to be switching gears. We talked about birds, and now we're going to talk a little bit about tortoises, turtles, and terrapins, and the diversity in the Florida panhandle. Dan, welcome. Do we have you with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Great. All right. Now let's see if I can. Should I have automatically have control? Uh, it depends. And if you don't, Josh can help. There we go. All right, so as Caitlin mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you about our research with terrapins, tortoises, and box turtles in the Florida Panhandle. So I work with the U.S. Geological Survey, um, and we're studying a multitude of species here in the Florida Panhandle and even in parts of the northern Gulf of Mexico. We're looking at sea turtles, including loggerheads, greens, and Kemp's ridleys. And then we've also, in recent years, expanded out into diamondback terrapins, uh, gopher tortoises, and box turtles, which are the three species I'm going to be talking to you today. So a little about what we study, and these are some just general overview for the majority of our projects. Uh, one of the big ones is long-term monitoring. So we go back to these populations on a yearly basis, and we're looking for things like the population demographics. So we're looking at sex ratios, age and size classes. Uh, we're looking at movement and how these animals are using the habitat. So we're using uh, market capture, satellite, radio, and acoustic tags. And on some of our sea turtle work, we've actually been able to use turtle-borne cameras. So we're actually able to put cameras on turtles and get a turtle eye view of what's going on. And then we're also taking genetic samples and samples to be used for diet analysis. Can we go to the next slide? All right, so we're gonna start off talking to you about our Dimeback Terrapin research, which began in 2017. So just some quick background on terrapins. Uh, they can be found across coastal habitats from Massachusetts to Texas. We have seven subspecies, five of which can be found in Florida. Three of those are endemic. The primary one we have here in the Florida panhandle is the ornate, which I've pictured here on the right. And throughout their range, they're faced with a variety of challenges, including habitat loss since they're in coastal habitats, bycatch, especially in crab traps, and their harvest is to be sent overseas, partially for food or for the pet trade. Uh, terrapins come in a variety of colors, which makes them highly sought after. Currently, we don't have federal listing for the species in the US, but on a state by state level, they are listed. In Florida, there is currently no listing, but they are up for review for potential listing in the state. Uh, next slide. So some of our objectives for our project is to fill a gap in the Florida panhandle. So for the most part, the region has been very understudied. There's only one research project that has come out of the region, especially in recent years. So we're trying to fill this gap and uh, shed a light on the terrapins that are in this region. So we're doing this through the mark recapture to get population demographics. We're sampling individuals for future genetic and diet research. Some of that is actually contributing to uh, FWC statewide assessment on terrapins. 
uh, we're establishing presence and absence. So actually trying to figure out, all right, they're on the coast, but what areas of the coast are they actually using? Uh, determining the habitat usage and range. So we're doing that through uh, tracking with acoustics, satellites, or VHF. And we've even included a citizen science aspect similar to that of sea turtle monitoring throughout the state where we're actually trying to identify female terrapin nesting sites and get long-term monitoring on those sites as well. All right, we go to the next slide. So just the visual for you. Uh, you can see in the red, these are locations throughout the region where we have research either going on or plan on starting research um, to actually get hands on individuals and answer some of those questions. In white, we have the locations of our citizen science efforts. So these are the areas where we have people actually able to go out and monitor specific nesting sites. The hope is to have white and red dots at all the sites on this map, but uh, it's a slow growing project. We're not trying to rush into things too quick and build a strong base uh, going forward. And we go to the next slide. So some of what we've been able to do so far, four of the locations that I had on the map, we've actually been able to get hands on and tag individuals. We've marked 729 individuals since 2017. Our first population estimate from our research is out of St. Joseph Bay with an estimate of around 2,414 individuals. And we've also found that the population is potentially skewed towards males. So some of the preliminary uh, data that we've gotten from these populations giving us our first insight. The other study I referenced earlier, Landark Reef, which is in the eastern portion of the Panhandle, uh, is the only other research done out here that was done in 2015, and they have a population estimate of 929. Uh, we've been able to, since that research, get out to that site, and we're working on continuing long-term monitoring of that population as well. As for the nesting, we have four counties, mostly out in the Western Panhandle, where we actually have volunteers monitoring nesting sites. But we do have uh, two additional counties where we do have sites like Gulf County, where we know where they're nesting, but we don't have the long-term monitoring with a volunteer group set up yet. But we have been able to engage over 20 volunteers into the project, so slowly but surely growing up that base. And we can continue. Next slide. So as this pertains to Aner and Little St. George, uh, we do hope in 2021 to get out to Little St. George and better identify the habitat use and where on the island that they are using some of the habitat. This box in red is a lot of the marsh area out on the island where um, terrapins have been reportedly sighted, which is great. So we do know that they're, they are out there, but we'd like to get a more exact idea of how are they using the habitat, how much of it are they using, and then are there individuals nesting out on the island? So these are some of the questions we hope to answer out there. Next slide. And then just going for like future plans into 2021 in the coming years, uh, we want to continue our monitoring efforts. Like I said, we like to do the long-term monitoring, um, identify population structure through genetic sampling. We'll hopefully be expanding efforts this year onto Little St. George, St. Vincent, National Wildlife Refuge, and really get out into the Western Panhandle for the research side of our work, as well as continue to expand the citizen science program, get more volunteers involved, locate more of these nesting sites throughout the region, and then as well continue the monitoring there. And you can kind of double click. So I'm going to talk to you now about our gopher tortoise work, which began last year. Next slide. And our objectives for this, or oops, there we go. All right, so our tortoise, just quick background. You can see we have this map here on the top right. Um, gopher tortoise populations are in decline throughout their range, but in the Western part of their range, highlighted in orange on that map, is where they are federally listed as threatened. Throughout the rest of their range, they are not federally listed, but they are listed on the state level. In Florida, they are listed as threatened. Gopher tortoises are a keystone species, so they are considered very important to the habitat with over 360 species documented using their burrows. But uh, right now, they are under review on the federal level to hopefully have the entire range covered under that federal listing. And we can go to the next slide. So our objectives for our specific uh, tortoise project here are to also fill some of the gaps that exist in the Florida Panhandle. And more specifically, we're looking at some of the tortoises that are living out on barrier islands. 
So to fill these gaps, we're using line transect distance sampling, which is used across tortoise studies to monitor populations and get population estimates. We're getting population demographic information through capturing, marking, and sampling individuals. We are hoping in the future to look at genetic relationship between the island populations we're studying and some of the mainland populations as well. And on these islands, we're really curious about how are the tortoises using these habitats and how that could compare to the tortoises that use mainland areas. So this map here just shows you some of the areas that we're either working or plan to be working in the coming year. Uh, in white with Tyndall and St. Joe Bay State Buffer Preserve, these are areas where they plan or have their own tortoise surveys already being conducted and we're working in conjunction with their work. Red are areas where we hope to begin some of these studies. Um, right now we're out on St. Vincent National Wildlife Refuge and uh, we are actually out there conducting our first line transect sampling and hopefully we'll have population estimates from the island in the coming year. So some of the preliminary data we've gotten in the past year, uh, we've been able to locate 99 burrows. We've confirmed that at least 41 of those burrows are occupied. So we got at least 41 individuals across our study sites. We've marked 10 individuals, including six males, three females, and one subadult individual. Our St. Vincent survey, so this is where we're doing the line transect distance sampling. We have 28 tortoises observed out of a total of 57 burrows that have been found. And on Little St. George, uh, we've had some preliminary work out there where we have four tortoises observed out of a total of 16 burrows found. So we can continue to the next slide. We got a map here of Little St. George. So when we went out here, there was already some preliminary data from the folks at Aner where some of the tortoises were already uh, living. So we were able to get out to these sites. This was only one day that we were able to get out last year to identify some of these burrows. Uh, you can see that they're currently, from what we found, clustered in two spots. But our hope going forward is that we'll be able to get out to the island more often to get a full uh, transect survey done out there to get a population estimate and find out exactly where on the island all the tortoises are and how much of the habitat they're actually using. So future plans for the tortoise project, um, we're hoping to get population estimates, not just for our St. Vincent population, but also, as I mentioned, some additional sites that include Little St. George, Eglin Cape Sandblast, and St. Joseph Peninsula State Park. Uh, we're gonna continue capturing and marking tortoises going forward into 2021 when the weather warms and they decide to leave their burrows. And then um, we're gonna be hopefully tracking the tortoises view via radio telemetry to get a better idea of their habitat use, and we'll be identifying the population structure through genetic sampling. Let me go to the next slide. So the last species I'm going to talk to you about is our box turtle work that also began in 2020. So just some quick background. Uh, they are currently not federally listed as a species. They do vary listing on by state, similar to that of the terrapins. Uh, they also have no current listing in Florida. Uh, the eastern box turtle is divided up into four subspecies. Here in the panhandle, we have the Gulf Coast subspecies that we get to work with, and they are also subject to uh, threats by habitat loss and the pet trade and harvesting. They are a unique subspecies in that they are the largest of the subspecies, and the males, as you can see pictured in this photo, will actually get white heads, which makes them unique and sought after. We can go to the next slide. So some of our objectives. This one's actually a little bit different in how it got started. This is a collaboration with the Bay County Box Turtle Project, which as the name says, is a project out of Bay County. I included a link to their Facebook page if you would like to find out more information about their project. But it's 100% citizen science focused and focusing on box turtles inhabiting uh, neighborhood residential areas. So as a collaborative effort, we're hoping to help expand the work that they've started into Gulf and Franklin counties. And we want to identify the locations where the box turtles are living, habitat preferences, especially in these residential areas. How are they moving in these residential areas? And then hopefully future expand this project outside of the citizen science neighborhood area into some of the protected areas we have throughout the region. So another map for you to just give you an idea of um, where we're working. 
you have the white on the left, which is Bay County, the red represent Gulf and Franklin County, and the green dots represent uh, St. Joseph Peninsula State Park, Eglin Air Force Base, Cape Sandblast, St. Vincent National Wildlife Refuge, and Little St. George as natural areas that we hope to move into. So this is data collected, not including what work has already been done by the Bay County project, but uh, we allow individuals in the community to report uh, just sightings. So this is a picture of box turtles with a location, which is giving us uh, an area of where the turtles are. Individuals that we can actually get hands on uh, via reports from the community are receiving an individual ID number, which you can see here on the right in this picture. It's a letter number series that's unique to each turtle. And we're using this number, this visual number as a way to get members of the community as an easy way for them to report sightings of box turtles back to us. So through these sightings, we'll actually hopefully be able to get some movement data on how much of these residential neighborhoods are these turtles using. As well as giving them an individual ID, we are taking measurements and weights of all the turtles and taking photos for future identification. Since we started this in Gulf County in the fall of 2020, we have 30 individual box turtles tagged, as well as three trained volunteers who are able to assist in tagging individuals. Franklin County, we're hoping to start really getting ground there in 2021, so we do not have any individuals tagged, but we do have our first volunteer trained to assist us in getting box turtles tagged out there in the county. And we'll hopefully see that part of the program grow in 2021. Part of that hope for Franklin County is to get out onto Little St. George and see how many box turtles are out on Little St. George, what parts of the habitat they're using. So just generally like we've been talking about with the terrapins and the tortoises, we're just trying to get an idea of where these animals are, what habitats are they using, how many you know, what the structure of these populations look like and really answer some of these questions that not just grow our research program, but also help managers of these properties uh, better understand what's going on. So our future plans for the project, uh, we're going to continue to engage more Gulf and Franklin County residents in the box turtle project. As I mentioned, expanding into the natural areas around the region and then identify the population structure uh, through genetic sampling of these individuals in residential and natural areas. And to the last slide, and this is just reoccurring patterns here of our future research is just to continue monitoring the current populations that we've already started monitoring, grow our citizen science efforts uh, across multiple species, expand to some of the new locations throughout the region, and once we have all this great data, actually get down to getting some of the analysis done once we have enough of it. So that way we can get population estimates, uh, genetic data, uh, diet of these individual, of individual populations, and then the habitat usage across the range. And just to you know, finish off, just a great thank you to everybody who's been involved. We've had between citizen scientists, interns, staff, um, it's been a great, it's been a big project, especially with this many species. So thank you to everybody that's been involved. And with that, I'm done and I look forward to any questions later on. Great, thanks, Dan. Yeah, that is quite a diversity of species that you're working on. And, um, you know, us at Ainer, we're happy to keep collaborating with you, um, especially the gopher tortoise has got a place in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, another set of species that has a, a place in my heart are the sea turtles. Um, after so many years of sweating out there on Little St. George Island, um, I'm looking forward to hearing what Dr. Meg Lamont has to say about satellite tracking sea turtles in Northwest Florida. Meg, are you on with us? Uh, yeah, I should be. I can hear you. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Yeah, take it away and let Josh know if you need help advancing. Hopefully it works. No, we're good so far. Um, thank you, Caitlin and everybody else for organizing this. It's been really uh, an enjoyable symposium to see all the work that's going on in and around Aner. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, satellite tracking sea turtles. And I'm going to start by just giving a brief uh, overview of our research program and the work we've done with loggerheads. And then I want to focus primarily on the green turtle tracking that we've been doing. 
Um, loggerheads that nest in the southeast United States are part of uh, the world, one of the world's largest loggerhead nesting populations. And that group has been divided genetically into 10 management units, uh, including a genetically distinct group that nests in the northern Gulf of Mexico. It's the second smallest nesting group in this population, the smallest group nests in the dry tortugas. Green turtles also nest in Florida, um, but green turtles have historically been considered a tropical species. Uh, so they nest in fairly consistent, but really low numbers in the Northern Gulf. Those numbers have in been increasing in recent years though. So we've been tagging nesting sea turtles on the St. Joseph Peninsula since 1998. Uh, our program, our study site has expanded uh, during that time. We went expanded north onto the peninsula in 2008 and east uh, onto Indian Pass in 2018. So we're now surveying about 20 kilometers of beach. During that time, we've tagged just over a thousand individual loggerheads. And when we do the standard workup, we just um, mark the individuals with metal flipper tags and a pit microchip type tag. Uh, 60 of those individual loggerheads have received a satellite tag. And we use those data to see what habitats the turtles are using during the nesting season. Um, and once they leave the nesting beach, where are they going and what are the habitats that they rely on? So the figure on the right shows um, the foraging areas for those loggerheads that we've tracked. Um, each little light blue box is, a, is an area, a little uh, grid cell that's been used by a foraging loggerhead. The darker ones uh, show cells that have been used by more than one individual. And you can see they forage off the continental shelf of um, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, off Southwest Florida. And surprisingly, uh, about 40% of the individuals remained and foraged in the Northern Gulf. And that's surprising to us because sea turtles as a species are considered long distance migrants. Uh, but the ones, that, uh, at least a, a bunch of the ones in the Northern Gulf don't really wanna move and they, they travel you know, less than five kilometers, sometimes less than one kilometer from the nesting beach and establish foraging areas in that region. In fact, none of the loggerheads that we've satellite tracked have ever left the Gulf. We've combined our, nest, our tracking data set for loggerheads with um, Dr. Donna Shaver's uh, tracking data set for Kemp's Ridleys from Padre Island National Seashore. And these little green splotches are the home ranges for our loggerheads, and the light blue splotches are the home ranges for the Kemp's. And there's pretty good geographic division between the two species, loggerheads on the east and Kemp's in the west. Those red areas show areas that uh, both species use. And again, it highlights the importance of the Northern Gulf to both of these species between sort of the Mississippi coast and central panhandle. There's high conservation value to those regions because it's supporting multiple species. Next. And as I said, green turtles also nest in the Northern Gulf, but they nest in very small numbers. And because of that, we really know nothing about them. It's difficult to encounter them, it just takes luck to encounter one on the beach. So we really don't have any information about the greens that nest in this region. Next. This just shows statewide nesting numbers for green turtles in Florida. This is from FWC webpage. And the primary things that I want to point out is green turtles nest in an every other year pattern. So 2015, 17, 19, those were what we call green years. That's when the green turtle, we expect green turtles to nest. Um, and, the, and the odd years, I mean, the even years, 16 and 18, we had very low numbers. You can also see that the numbers of nests have increased in the state, 37,015, 53,000 in both 17 and 19. And interestingly, uh, after we just released 2020 nesting numbers for greens. Now, 2020, remember, is supposed to be a down year, and we had over 26,000 nests. That's oh, significantly higher, obviously, than the past two down years where it was about 5,000. So everyone's really excited to see what's gonna happen in 2021. Can you advance it one, please? Uh, this is just highlighting the Panhandle counties. And again, how few nests we have, that's fine, you can go. <laughs> Since 2008, we have marked 52 green turtle nests on the St. Joseph Peninsula. We've flipper and pit tagged 30 individual green turtles and we've been able to satellite track 13 of those individuals. When we 
tag, flipper or pit tag, um, any turtle, we collect also collect a skin sample. And those skin samples go to Dr. Brian Shamblin at the University of Georgia for genetic analyses. And he has he's the person who um, defined the population structure for loggerheads in the southeast. And he's doing similar work for green turtles using our samples, but also nest samples collected by FWC from green turtle nests. And he has found similar structure throughout the southeast. There's different genetic uh, management units for green turtles, genetically distinct greens nesting in northwest Florida. But the thing that's different with greens than loggerheads is that there are two genetically distinct groups nesting in northwest Florida. Green turtles nesting west of the Tyndall Air Force Base area are genetically different than green turtles nesting east of the Tyndall Air Force Base area. So that is a, an interesting finding. These are preliminary data. He's still looking at samples. Um, and we believe that, that, that we have these two groups because green turtles exhibit a lot higher site fidelity than loggerheads. So there's probably less mixing. Uh, you can go forward one more. We've been satellite tracking, as I said, um, green turtles at three different nesting beaches, um, two on the St. Joseph Peninsula and one at Eglin Air Force Base on Santa Rosa Island. And as I said, we've satellite tagged 13 individuals, but you can see one female here we tracked twice. She's got the asterisk by her. She, we tagged her in 2017 and she came back and nested in 2019. We were able to satellite tag her again so we can compare her tracks and look at uh, you know, her fidelity both within season and her migratory pathway and her foraging area. The other thing I wanna point out that was very exciting was number eight there, gator. Um, he's a male. That was a male adult green turtle that got a little over anxious and excited and followed a female up onto the nesting beach on Santa Rosa Island. And Kathy Galt and her crew were able to capture him and put a satellite tag on him. And it's very rare to capture and track an adult male of any species, but particularly green turtles. So we're very excited about that. Next. Okay. This is the all of the satellite locations for the uh, 13 different individuals that we tracked. And before I get into the patterns of movement, I need to point out that these are raw satellite locations. We're still currently filtering and processing these data. Um, and they just weren't ready for this presentation, unfortunately, but this still uh, gives you a really good idea of the patterns of movement. Um, the thing about satellite tags is there's an antenna on the tag. And when it breaks the water surface, it transmits messages to the satellite the satellite sends those to a processing station and they process those messages and send us back a latitude and a longitude. But sometimes the turtle's antenna only breaks the surface for a really brief moment and it may only transmit two or three messages. Um, so the number of messages that the satellite gets uh, regulates the accuracy of the location that we get. And we have an error estimate associated with every latitude and longitude that we get from the tag. So a, only a handful of uh, messages may result in a fairly inaccurate, plus or minus a kilometer or, or two, um, which doesn't matter so much when you're they're traveling across the Gulf. But we also get some wonky points. So you kind of have to squint when you look at these and recognize that just look at the broad patterns and, and ignore those ones that are like up inland and clearly the turtle didn't go up there. Um, you can see we have a pretty evident pattern of migration and foraging home ranges for these greens. Most of the turtles traveled pretty close to shore and ended up down near the Florida Keys. But the one individual uh, in the light purple who traveled to Mexico, and that's one of the turtles that we were able to tag in 2020. Uh, we were surprised to get so many greens in 2020, and we we're really fortunate uh, to be able to get some satellite tags out. And we we're particularly happy because uh, we would not, we wouldn't know that greens go to Mexico if we hadn't been able to satellite tag that individual. There was another pattern of movement that we observed uh, as the turtles were leaving the Northwest Florida region. Some of the individuals hugged the coast really closely, including going up through the Big Bend, while others cut the corner there at the Big Bend. Um, this was not just a, a few individuals, it was sort of 50-50 as to whether they you know, stayed within the Big Bend region or cut that corner. And there doesn't seem to be a pattern associated with it, like smaller individuals do one or the other. So it's a little bit of a mystery that we need to look at a little bit closer. Next. And this was the two tracks for Robin, the individual we were able to track twice. You can see very similar high site fidelity to her 
um, migratory pathway and both times she went to the Keys and she was one of the ones that cut that corner there at the Big Bend. She did it twice, both times. So it uh, you know, provides some support to the fact that it's a sort of hardwired thing in the turtle and not dependent on you know, environmental variables. Next. So the question is, do uh, green turtles use aner and this beautifully colored, uh, like someone threw confetti in the air um, image? Yes, they absolutely use um, the waters of aner. Next. Some of the individuals like these two here uh, just pass through, sort of skirt the islands, and others like these three spent a considerable amount of time within the boundaries of Aner. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about exactly how they uh, used, used the property um, for these three examples, coral, snapper, and flounder. OK, next. So as I mentioned before, we can get different quality locations from the satellite tags. And if the turtle stays out of the water for a significant amount of time, this, the tag is able to transmit a whole bunch of messages. And that gives us really high quality locations. But it's rare for a turtle to be out that long. Occasionally, they'll bask at the surface for a long time. But most of the time, especially when they're near the nesting beach, if we get a cluster of real high quality locations, especially if they're in the middle of the night, we have a pretty good evidence that the turtle emerged on the nesting beach. So for those three individuals that spent so much time on, on and near Little St. George and St. George Island, we had a, a cluster, several clusters of high quality locations. And I uh, connected with Megan Lamb at Aner to see if any of those clusters corresponded to emergence events for green turtles. So you can see here in the table at the top, Coral, we tagged on July 11th. 10 days later, on the 21st, we had a cluster of high quality locations. Yes, they did have a nest on Little St. George. Um, that was a, that's a 10 day internesting interval, which is a little bit short. That's about 12 days on average for greens, but definitely possible. We had another cluster on August 14th, which is 24 days. That's really long internesting interval. Uh, we did not see a cluster of locations of high quality locations for her before that. Uh, of course, if you divide 24 and a half, it's 12. So you know, this may have been two, she may have waited through two nesting intervals. Um, it also corresponded to a nest on Little St. George. Again, on the third, similar thing. And on the 19th, uh, which is September 19th, really late, we, we often don't see nesting activity at all in September. Uh, we had another cluster and they had a false crawl on Little St. George. Um, can you click advance again ahead? Uh, so this is Snapper. We tagged her on July 25th. Eight days later, we had a cluster of points uh, that correspond to these blue locations on Little St. George, and they did document a false crawl on Little St. George. Um, and it's only eight days, so we don't expect her to nest that soon. Interestingly, if you look on the east end there of St. George Island, we had another cluster of, of high quality locations there also. And that was about four days after, so about August 6th. And uh, that would put the internesting interval right at 12 days. So I'd be really curious to see if St. George State Park had, an, had a green nest that day. One more, please. And this is flounder. Flounder is particularly interesting. We tagged her on July 24th. And two days later, we had this cluster of locations uh, right near the bridge in uh, St. George Island. Um, there was a nest on Little St. George, but first off, she only nested two days before. You, you do not expect a turtle to nest that close, uh, two days in between. And, and these locations are pretty far from Little St. George. But Janice Becker's group uh, did document a false crawl on St. George Island that day, and it very well could be that that was flounder. Um, even so, to emerge uh, and false crawl, uh, two days after she nested is kind of curious. And it's even more, more curious because it, that 24th, the nest on the 24th turned out to be her last nest. In fact, the next day on uh, July 27th, she was off of Cedar Key already. She was heading uh, south and gone. So uh, it's interesting if this was indeed her false crawling that day, why she emerged so close to her nesting, her previous nest and during her you know, post nesting migration. And what you can see from uh, these three examples, uh, number one, it provides um, Aner with information on their nesting, on the 
the greens that provided those nests um, and false cross, but it also fills in a lot of gaps when we can sort of ground truth the satellite tracking location, the satellite tracking data. It really fills in a, a lot of the details uh, that we wouldn't otherwise get if we don't, if we uh, aren't able to have these, uh, the nesting and the uh, false crawl information, particularly for greens, where it's so difficult to get them anyhow because of the low nesting numbers. Okay, next. This is just an example of the uh, post-processing that we're doing. Uh, this is for turtles and uh, we do some state space modeling. So the green locations on the map are areas where the turtles are foraging during their migration and the white dots are where they're just traveling, they're not foraging. And so it makes sense. The turtles that are cutting the corner there, Big Bend aren't foraging, but the ones that are going through the Big Bend are, which you know may provide some more evidence, uh, more information to help us kind of solve the mystery of why some are doing that and some aren't. We hope to have these done um, and su submitted in by the end of the summer. Ho hopefully they'll be published by then. Okay, that's it. <laughs> you can go to the next one and I'll be happy to answer questions when we have them. Okay, thanks Meg. Um, it's just so interesting to realize how many things could actually impact and any one sea turtle, you know, whether going from the panhandle all the way down to Florida and everything in between. Um, yeah, it's kind of amazing to think about that and what to do with management. <laughs> um, so I think we have uh, plenty of time for questions and I, and I know we've got some, and I'm wondering if Josh is gonna help me ask some of these questions and if all of our Speakers, Nick, Rhea, Dan, and Meg could just hang around all together because I, I think they could be shuffled up. Yeah, um, I was gonna do the questions, Kate. Uh, okay. I had one one request first though. Would, would all the panelists please turn on their cameras? I guess Nick can't, but <laughs> that would be great. And I'm gonna get my face off. Okay. Here's for all of the speakers. Um, we seem to be expecting both subtle and dramatic changes in ephemeral habitats your species uh, focus occupy, such as sea level rise, temperatures, storm events. Can you each touch on what managers can do to support the ephemeral and changing habitats for these already imperiled species? Dan, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. I was like waiting to go first. Um, <laughs> I think especially when it comes to the presentation or the species I was talking about, one of the first things is understanding the species, uh, figuring out where they are and what habitats they're using. And that's one of the interesting things we've seen on St. Vincent, for example, with the gopher tortoises. You have a large island there, but a lot of the burrows seem to be on the outer edges of the island. So in terms of erosion or potential storms, those individuals may be more susceptible than some of the ones that may live on more inland portions or like the individuals on Little St. George or on a smaller island. So I think one of the first steps we really need to do is figure out what habitats they're using, where they're using it to really establish what kind of threats that they're going to have uh, facing them, especially living in these dynamic environments. Great. Rhea, you wanna jump in there? Yeah, um, the question was about uh, overwash or? There are several. Um, this one is basically uh, we're experiencing subtle and dramatic changes in ephemeral habitats mm -hmm. for the species you focus on. Yeah. Um, so okay. Yeah. yeah um, you know, as Dan mentioned, the coastal habitat is highly dynamic. Um, you know, I, from the looking at the data we have for snowy plovers, we can see that they're highly tied to that coastal system and the succession of the dune system in particular. Um, and so we see that we have periodic periods of um, of you know high productivity and declines in the population depending on you know time since storm and things like that and if we start coupling that with sea level rise at the same time we end up seeing you know changes in the the um, the dune features as well as you know shrinking of the habitat elsewhere and so it really you know con confounds that issue of having a lack of habitat for the species to to grow um, regardless of any management actions we can do we still have to have habitat to contain the species 
I mean, so it, it is it is a, um, a you know a problem that we're dealing with, and as you know, Dan mentioned, a lot of it with our data and our mon monitoring is to really look at where the species are and the needs for the species, and then try to figure out you know adaptive management processes and what works to improve um, conditions. Um, and using some of like like mentioned St. Joseph State Park as like a reference site, so things that we can do at historic locations to improve conditions to put, potentially get birds to recolonize those areas are important as well. Meg, did you have anything to add? Uh, the only, I, I have a short and sweet answer and that is protect the dunes. In addition to everything that Ray and Dan said, protect the dunes. Okay, great. Well, since we have you uh, up to bat, so to speak, I have a question that just came in um, and it's, do you, this is for Dan and Meg, do you have any ideas as to what led to the increase in green nests over the last year? And uh, what do you expect for this year? Uh, there's probably a lot of contributing factors to the increase in greens. There's been a lot of management that has uh, protected them, you know, the list, listing and various management actions that has limited their, you know, the uh, variety of mortality factors. Um, honestly, uh, the, the warming trends that we've seen, the the greens are able to expand. We've had green turtle nests in Delaware, so we're having range expansion for these tropical species. And greens are probably one of the most um, uh, like susceptible, uh, not the right word, but um, the, the ones that are we're going to see the biggest expansion from because they're tropical. Um, and I think those two together have, have really contributed to to what we're seeing with that. I expect they'll continue range expansion for greens. I think nesting greens up in, in North and South Carolina and, and Virginia is gonna become similar to loggerhead nesting now. As long as we protect the dunes. <laughs> protect the dunes. <laughs> and uh, for Rhea, I have a question. Um, have you or anyone else looked at the environmental conditions that may have led to the increased numbers of breeding snowies from 09 um, 15 slash 16, or do you think the increase were largely in part to increase management? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so uh, 2010 is actually the first year we started directly managing snow plovers at those coastal state parks. And so what I mean by directly managing, we started post pre-posting habitat and protecting areas where that had potential um, that potential for, for shorebirds. So that's not just snow plovers, but for all of our focal species. And we started, we got funding through NIFWIS Power Flight Program to implement predation management at that time. And that was the first time we actually had shorebird specific predation management efforts. In the past, you know, it was more coastal systems. Oftentimes it was happening after the shorebird season was over and things like that. And so, yeah, we it was really, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we attribute much of that, um, that increase in the population to our direct management efforts, um, as well as um, it's, I'm the opposite perspective of, of Meg here, but we also during that time period, we still had open open habitat conditions that were that remained um, from the hurricanes of 04 and 05. And so birds are early successional species, so they like that open habitat. And so during that period, we had open habitat that's preferred by the species that we're also managing two of the biggest threats, which is human disturbance and predator presences. And so, you know, we were with all of that, those pieces combined, the population was experiencing an uh, increase at the time. So that answers the question. Okay, and we have one for Nick. Um, hang on just a second. I'm flipping back and forth between the <laughs> Padlet and the questions. Um, Nick, do you see potential? Uh, do you see potential in the future of collaboration with oyster restoration programs or groups toward reef restorations and habitat for the American oyster catcher in the future? Yeah, I think that's a really good question and, and absolutely is the, the short answer. Uh, obviously, oyster catchers are very tied to, to these oyster reefs and, and that both as a food source and also for helping their, their nesting habitat. And um, so, yeah, it's definitely a good area for collaboration and working together. We have had some of that in the Cedar Key area. Uh, some of the restoration efforts out there are directly tied to trying to regrow oysters as well as uh, preserve oyster catcher habitat. So they definitely go close hand in hand. 
Great. And while we're with you, um, then I had another question come in for both you and Rhea. Um, with the future of climate change, do you think the oyster catcher or snowy pl plover are more adaptable? That's a hard question. Uh, so I, I know one big thing with oysters is if you get the, the conditions right, oysters can grow and outpace uh, sea level rise. And so I would think that oysters or oyster catchers being related to that, maybe their nesting habitat might be a uh, more stable over time, but uh, I don't know, hard to say. I'll defer to defer to Rhea if she's got a different opinion. I was gonna say from a population range wide perspective, probably snowies because they have interior habitat. But if we're looking at Florida, um, I would say oyster catchers are probably more, um, have favor more favorable conditions given the variety of habitat types they nest in. Um, wow. in beaches, march marshes, dredge spoil, you know, and, and as, as well as shell rake habitat. So there's a variety more, variety of features and, uh, and conditions that they utilize in the state. I know that's not quite the <laughs> second one answer, but yeah. Right. And um, since we're with Rhea here, I have another one. Uh, what are you hopeful about in terms of shorebird conservation in the panhandle for the future? And what are the biggest hurdles to increasing breeding success in the snowy plovers? Yeah. Um, I guess in terms of what I'm hopeful for, um, you know, we've we've really improved the coordination and collaboration amongst like coastal coast task part partners. So that you know, even here on this call with or the symposium here with you know Dan and, and Meg, um, really you know, collaborating, communicating between sea turtle, beach mouse folks, recognizing that the the birds and the coastal species require different needs is really important um, in terms of management. So that we're not just managing one suite of species or one view of what that coastal habitat should look like. We're looking at all of those nuanced pieces that all of the species that rely on that system need. That is, that's really important and where I'm really hopeful for like just change um, moving forward in, in our, our region. And I think that sets us apart from some of the other regions in the state. Okay, great. And Dan, um, I have a couple of questions for you. It's, uh, how did the gopher tortoises get onto the barrier islands? <laughs> That's a great question, and um, they do have the ability to float onto these islands, so it is potential that they spread on their own. Um, there are some people that believe that the tortoises were brought to the island by people years ago. Uh, it's hard to say whether or not that's true because people build houses on the same areas that tortoises like, which are the upland habitats that stay dry. So people see that tortoises and houses in the same place as a correlation for that. But we don't really have a confirmed answer on how they got there. Like on a place like St. Joseph Peninsula, it's possible that they can just use the land bridge since it's actually connected to the mainland. But in terms of the other sites, it's more likely that either somebody would have had to bring them over there or during a storm could have been washed out there. Hmm. Interesting. And that's one of the things we hope to answer with our with our project, looking at the genetics. Like how how related are Little St. George tortoises to St. Vincent Island tortoises? Um, so hopefully yeah. we can get an answer soon. And then Dan, um, do you think any of your study sites are suitable as gopher tortoise recipient sites? <laughs> um, Honestly, right now, I think the only one that could potentially be a recipient site would be St. Vincent, and that's mostly due to the size of the island. But what we really need to look at more closely is habitat management on at that site, as well as how much available habitat there is. It's a large island, but there's still large portions of it that flood, that are lowland. So that's part of you know our goals is to establish not just what is the current population, but how much habitat is there actually available to the tortoises? So out of the current sites, that would be the one that I think would be more likely to be, but um, that's a very far off into the future uh, potential. Okay. And um, another question is, how could mangroves impact terrapin populations in the future? That is a great question, and one that we're actually potentially gonna look at uh, going forward. But um, there is actually one of the subspecies of terrapin is the mangrove terrapin that is in the South Florida Everglades area that does live amongst mangroves. 
So they can adapt. And I think terrapins in our area would adapt to a mangrove habitat. Um, I believe if Caitlin's still on, she actually has reported to us that during some of her mangrove studies on Little St. George, she's actually seen terrapins among the mangroves. So I don't think it will hinder them, but it will definitely change how they use the habitat. And that's definitely something we'd have to look at uh, going forward um, that we actually hope to answer. But I think it won't negatively affect them. I think it's just gonna change things for them. Great. And uh, okay, Meg, I have a couple more questions for you. Uh, one is, how do you think the recent and recent major freeze event in Texas will impact green and loggerhead populations in the Gulf? Um, are these two different subpopulation sea turtles? Question marks. Question mark. Yeah, the, the cold stun question is really interesting, and it's something we're working on right now because, as we know, um, we get big cold stun events in St. Joe Bay, too. Um, it it probably won't affect loggerheads too much. Loggerheads don't strand as frequently as green turtles do. It's primarily the juvenile greens are smaller and more susceptible. And how it affects them, I mean, we're to the we're pretty good now at reducing mortality in the cold in these cold stun events. Even in the Texas event, the updates I've been getting is 50%, which is high, but it's not nearly as high as it could be. I mean, if if we weren't doing anything, and they're they're talking seven eight thousand turtles over there right now. Um, but but it, it is an interesting question because it's a pulse, you know, it's a real quick high mortality event. Even if it's uh, only 50 turtles, it's rare to have a mortality event that's multiple individuals at a real short time, a couple of days. Um, and we don't know a lot about the, you know, abundance um, and the population dynamics, the flexibility of these in-water populations. It's been a challenge. It's, uh, there's, there's several projects going on right now that, that we're really um, you know, working with uh, as collaboratively with groups like NOAA um, to, to come up with the best ways of getting those estimates. And then we can build in cold stun mortality. It's a project I'm working on with Alan Foley at FWC, who's a stranding coordinator, to, because we mark a lot of turtles in St. Joe Bay, and then they're either uh, recaptured during a stranding or there we recapture ones that were marked during the cold stun. So we can really look more closely at how these events are affecting the population. I feel a lot better about it now than we did. The first cold stun event we documented in St. Joe Bay was 2001. And, you know, it was the mortality rate was a lot higher. But by 2018, this last one, you know, it was, I mean, we, uh, I doubt 25% you know, what's, I think the mortality rate was lower than that. Okay. Big shout out to Gulf World for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, this this question is going to, uh, they said really interesting work uh, to verify GPS points and the actual nest uh, is neat. Great job. What will you utilize the tremendous data set towards conserving turtles? Well, the, the loggerhead, um, data have been used in so many different ways, and it's a good example. First off, it was used during the uh, oil spill assessment phase um, to show that turtles, like the 40% of the heads were in, they established home ranges in the Northern Gulf. And those home ranges are where the turtles spend most of their time. They spend a very short amount of time on the nesting beach. They go back to those home ranges and forage, and that's where they are 99% of the time. And we were able to use some additional like stable isotope techniques to show that they show fidelity. They were, so when they, if, if that was their home range, they were there, you know, 10 years ago or four years ago or during the oil spill. So uh, a simple thing, well, that's not necessarily a simple thing, but addressing things like the, like the oil spill, uh, the data were used to help develop the critical habitat designations for loggerheads. These are the same things that are going to happen with green turtles. As I said, we knew nothing. We really knew nothing about green turtles in the northern Gulf. Just being able to say there's two genetically distinct nesting groups. Um, if we start seeing declines in one place, we know, you know, where those turtles were originating. And understanding the habitat, is, as both Dan and Ray mentioned, for any species, you have to know where they are. If you don't know the habitats they rely on, the prey they rely on, um, you can't do 
you know, it's very difficult, especially for a tur uh, species like a turtle that moves so far. When we see declines in nesting turtles, and that's why the question about increases in greens is it's a little bit complicated because the greens that nest on our beaches, you know, you have to know where they're, they can be 20, 30 years old. So there's 20, 30 years of different actions, you know, management actions, threats, et cetera, that are affecting them. And these in-water populations, you know, they come from these different nesting beaches. You know, you have to be able to understand that before you can start addressing those issues. Okay, thank you. I uh, I don't see any more questions. Um, I, I did it did make me think of one after you said the oil spill. Do you remember all the nests that were relocated to the East mm -hmm. Coast? Were any of those have we any of those um, turtles coming back to the Gulf to nest? Well, unfortunately, none of those hatchlings were marked. The the eggs were oh. incubated. On at Kennedy Space Center and released um, onto the East Coast, uh, but the hatchlings weren't marked, so we don't know. You know, we're, we're seeing increases in loggerhead nesting, and as long as we keep seeing that, you know, that's the primary thing that we want to see. Um, we won't. I mean, those hatchlings, it'll be that was 2010. It'll be you know 2030. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before any of those come back, so that's the yeah. challenge. The turtles, they're long lived and it takes a while to figure figure those things out. Yeah. Well, that's all the questions I see, and uh, just thank you very much. I wanted to let everybody know that we are going to send out a, a link to a recording for the, the two days, and we're also sending out a quick evaluation. It's just a couple of questions. We'd appreciate everybody returning that. Kate, did you have any closing remarks? Yeah, I just want to thank each of you for uh, coming along on this. Um, I know you all are super busy, especially um, pre-shorebird nesting season <laughs> for you folks. But um, I work with each of you on a variety of different things. So I just want to say thanks for coming. And we really appreciate you talking about your specialty. Um, and also to say, if there were any hard questions, they were not mine. All right, thanks, guys. Anything else, Anita? No, that's all. Thank you so much for, for helping us produce the symposium. Okay. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.